OK, so um, time to start. All right. So a couple things before we begin. So the next, uh, this week, is all around uh, questions of what on the syllabus is called bearing witness. And we're going to look at forms of uh, testimony or forms of the testimonial genre over the next uh, two days. Those forms will take the, well, the forms of the testimonial genre that we'll look at are memoirs, video testimony, and poetry. And we'll see the three of these operate in some very different but also very overlapping ways. And they're all testimony by survivors. And so one of the things that we'll be confronting as well is the fact that insofar as you have testimony at all, you also have someone who has survived and is able to translate that experience in all of its physical and psychic dimensions into a narrative form or into language. And so there's a kind of process here of translation of an experience of survival being turned into words or language that's intended for an audience that wasn't there, right? In particular, an audience of people like listeners, like you and I, who then would potentially learn from those experiences that we ourselves did not go through. And so we'll also talk a little bit about the intended audience and also the aspirations of testimony, because one of the things you certainly realized in listening to Renee Firestone, if you got to the end of the video, a key aspiration of her testimony is its futurity, right? It's uh, not only learning from the past, but also a future that can be different with the knowledge that one takes. And so this is a, an element of testimony that I think is very central for us to reckon with. OK, a um, couple other things. I made some changes in the syllabus, and I'm sorry if you wanted everything stable, but I couldn't keep it stable for various reasons. And so I decided to condense the poetry, which I had originally done in two different days, into a single day. So I was going to do a, a separate lecture on Ceylon's Death Fugue, which in many ways stands as one of the most important poems ever, I think, created about the Holocaust. I'm going to do that lecture in connection with a number of other works of poetry on Thursday. So I condensed it. That'll probably mean that I don't talk about every single poem in great detail. I'll pick out a number that I think are representative. Um, all the poetry is on CCLE as a single file. I think it says week four, week five poetry. Obviously, it's all intended for Thursday. It's not a lot. Uh, there's maybe 10 poems. But I, like, like poetry, if you've ever, and of course you have in you know, your literature classes, poetry can be extremely difficult to parse and often requires a lot of thought, um, even though it's very short. So I included some study questions here, which you can just click, click on, which have some biographical information about who these poets are. So Ceylon, uh, Sutzkever, Sachs, and Gladstein. Um, this will open as like an HTML document, and if it looks like kind of weird, like it's all HTML characters, and you go, oh my gosh, what is this? Just open, just download it, and it'll open in a browser. So you just download it, open in Chrome or Firefox or whatever, and it'll look normal. Not to worry. Um, so the lecture t on, on Thursday will be all around poetry as testimony or poetry as witnessing. The reason I did this is that I realized that there was a lot to say around resistance and, and what might be called righteousness. And so I changed some of the things in this week because I thought that we needed to confront acts of resistance in a more systematic and thorough way. Um, thinking about what resistance, what forms resistance took. And I mentioned the case of Bulgaria in passing a couple of times. Um, and I thought, you should look at some primary sources about what people were saying in 1940 and 1941 and 42 and 43 as debates were happening at the highest levels of the Bulgarian government as to whether to deport the Bulgarian Jews and also the debates that were happening in the Bulgarian Orthodox Church as to what stand they were going to take and who, who was rep prepared to risk what in the face of orders that had already come from Eichmann to deport the Bulgarian Jews. So I thought we should confront these documents, and I'll make sure they're available by the end of today for you. 
I cut out one reading, which was the one by Herman Kruk. It's going to stay there, but we're not going to actually have time to look at it. And then I want to look at a number of actions of single individuals um, who did things in defiance of authorities and it very much risked their professional well-being and their professional lives and paid the price sometimes um, greatly for doing what they did. And so one is a Japanese uh, council um, ambassador rather to Lithuania who issued transit visas to allow Jews to emigrate to Shanghai um, against the authority, Japanese uh, authorities. One is um, a woman who hid Jews in a library in Vilna and another is a woman who had been in some ways compared to the Polish Oskar Schindler but actually saved more Jews than Oskar Schindler and her story is not particularly well known um, until recently and, and smuggled um, many Jewish children out of the Warsaw Ghetto into safety. So I figured we should look at these stories to understand something of both the government dimension of resistance and the human dimension of resistance because resistance did occur. I think it's, it's easy enough for us to say, it's like it was impossible to resist, the Nazis had all the power, there, there was no way we could do anything, we just had to all, we all had to be behave and obey. And yet there's really telling examples of people who did resist and in so doing they risked everything. And to me that, that really raises an interesting question as to like what we are prepared to risk at any given time. So I'll also look then at resistance in Germany in week nine and we'll look at examples of uh, resistance that came through student action through the White Rose Society as well as anti-fascist uh, art that was produced by John Hartfield and I forget what else, ah, yeah. a, a protest actually against <laughs> the Nazis in 1943 believe it or not, right in, 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 at the height of the genocide in Berlin, uh, a protest in which no one was killed. So we'll talk a little bit about what this means because I think it's important for us to understand that it is possible to protest and resist even in the face of the most extreme totalitarian violence and one should understand what those possibilities were and also keep in mind that there were certainly few but they existed. So I hope you understand that I needed to make those changes. Um, the paper that will be due, not this week, but rather next week, will be on testimony and so really it will end with what I have to say on Thursday. So you'll have plenty of time and I'll have that also ready for you today. Okay, so we're going to go to testimony. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to start um, back here with uh, Primo Levi. And, and the reason I wanted to go back to this, I mentioned this, I guess, last time, but I think it's important for us to keep remembering this, is that most people who were sent to concentration camps or death camps did not testify. And it's hard for us, uh, when, when we read Ali Wiesel or listen to um, Rene Firestone or perhaps Primo Levi, we have to remember the anomalous nature of testimony. So you have millions of people who perished who never actually could compose what they experienced into a narrative form and testify or bear witness, right? They didn't survive. And so I wanted us always to reflect about that testimony on behalf of others. It's an important part of Elie Wiesel. He's also telling his father's story. Right? His father cannot, in his own words, tell his own story. His father did not survive. Renee Firestone, the story of her sister Clara, right? It's a critical part of her story. But also her parents' story. The fact that she was separated from her parents as soon as they arrived in Auschwitz. The fact that she tried to stay with her sister and her sister eventually becomes selected. And so her testimony is also on behalf of others. And so this is not to say, I don't necessarily think the word true witnesses is, uh, is, is perhaps the word we have to use. It's a word used by Primo Levi. But he does talk about uh, people who had actually, so to speak, gone and into the concentration camp, into the death camp, into the gas chamber. He sees them in some ways as the true witnesses. Now this also is a very common issue in testimony. He talks about why almost a sense of survivor's guilt. Many survivors, if you talk to them about their experiences, will say, 
you know, I survived. It was, you know, it was luck, but, you know, my, my brother should have been the survivor. My, my parents, they were the good ones. I was, you know, I was, I was sneaky or something, or, or perhaps I, I took someone's food or something else. And many survivors experience a tremendous amount of guilt in having survived. So even Primo Levi writes, we are those who by their prevarication, like we even maybe had to lie, misrepresent ourselves, get false papers, or abilities, or our good luck did not touch bottom. Those who did so, those who saw the Gorgon, those who were sent to the gas chambers, have not returned to tell about it, or if they have, they've returned mute. That is, they almost, they can't put it into words. And I should say that many times when we're looking at survivor testimony, there's an element of muteness that I think we have to recognize in a survivor's testimony that has to do with the trauma. I think this is very powerful in Renee Firestone's testimony. There's times where she can't put into words what she experienced. There are times in Elie Wiesel where all he can write is dot, dot, dot. That is to say, there's things he can't say because the experiences are so extreme and so traumatic that they defy everyday language or words or sentences. He goes on, the Muslim I mentioned before, those who were the walking dead, um, the submerged, the complete witnesses, those dis- whose disposition, he says, would have general significance, they are the rule, meaning most people were killed. We're the exception, the survivors. We who are favored by fate tried with more or less wisdom to recount not only our fate, but also that of others. So again, testimony on behalf of others. Indeed, of the drowned, on behalf of Clara, on behalf of his father. But this was a discourse on behalf of third parties, the story of things seen close at hand but not experienced personally. And he says, finally, this is because no one has ever returned to describe their own death. So by definition, testimony also means survival. The two go hand in hand. We can't possibly have testimony in this regard, at least as a complete testimony without survival. Now, there are examples of people who kept diaries uh, during, the, during the Third Reich who testified up until the very end of what they experienced. Um, if you have a chance to look at Hermann Kruck, who I mentioned, I, I won't have much time to talk about, but maybe I'll mention just in brief. He was someone who testified to the very end until he was killed in a labor camp in Estonia. He buried his diaries in the ground Someone saw where they were buried. That person happened to survive, and after the war, they were dug up, and there you have a testimony from within the event. This is very interesting. People who kept diaries or wrote letters from within the event, right? So it's testifying up until that very last moment where one can no longer write or save one's experience. The testimonies that we'll read have a certain amount of remove. That is to say, the person who wrote them did so after the fact. There's moments in Elie Wiesel where present experiences will intervene in a productive way to help understand past experiences. There's moments where knowledge after the fact also informs those experiences. And that's part of testimony. Testimony has many temporal dimensions. It doesn't go just chronologically. It's the present also helps us to understand the past knowledge gained later informs the way in which the story is told. This is not a bad thing. It's just simply a fact of the matter is if life goes on, those experiences and knowledge you have later become lenses through which to see the past and to make sense of it. Okay. So, I'm going to start with uh, kind of two questions. Um, and, uh, and these two questions will kind of treat... Well, I'll go through Elie Wiesel kind of first, and then I'm going to end with Rene Firestone today. And I think what's interesting about these two is that their experiences are very parallel, which is obviously why I chose the two. Um, that is to say, they were both deported very late uh, in the history of the Holocaust in 1944. Part of the kind of broader, this is kind of the large Hungary. Uh, um, so this is, she was technically Czech, although it came under Hungarian uh, rule in the, the summer of 44. Um, Elie Wiesel was from an area of Transylvania, which was again also part of Hungary at the time. Both were Jewish. Um, both were deported to Auschwitz. Both were old enough to be selected for work, and both had the separations with, um, they were deported with their families, 
And part of their story has to do with the separation they had in the case of Renee from her sister and her parents, and the case of Elie Wiesel from also his siblings and his parents, um, and the fact that most of the story is a father and son journey, and most of Renee Firestone's story is a sister and sister journey. So this is, uh, there's a lot of parallels uh, between the two. So the first question I want you to think about is what, when we think about survival, <laughs> How do we begin to even think about what this means to Ali Wiesel or to Renee Firestone? What, what is to survive, to have lived through something? Again, to go to the etymology of the term. Survival means to live beyond. By definition, it means living beyond something. It's not just experiencing, but it's living beyond and through something. So what does it mean to have lived through and beyond something? So that's the first question. Second question, and it's certainly connected with survival, because survival, again, means living through. What does it mean when we talk about dehumanization, which is precisely about what was meant to prevent living through, right? It was precisely to take away the humanity of these two people. Right? It's precisely to strip away all those elements that make them human. And that that's part of the testimony, is recounting this process of dehumanization, and yet simultaneously re recounting a process of having lived through something. So of having your humanity stripped away, and you would say, in some ways, having your humanity return. They go kind of hand in hand here. Obviously, testifying is also a very human thing to put into narrative one story and then to pass it down is also to essentially send a message or hope that uh, a lesson could be learned or perhaps um, a change might, might be able to occur if one is to testify because one survived this dehumanization. So how would you answer these questions? This kind of like, I'm gonna kind of, you can answer either one, but I'm kind of curious for you before I sort of like go through, you know, the processes and these testimonies. What does survival mean? And what does dehumanization entail? You can answer either. I'd be curious to hear from you. What do you think? Now that you've re read Elie Wiesel, you've listened to Renee Firestone, we've talked about Primo Levi. Who wants to volunteer? Go on. I should come out there, right? I should like, find you. <laughs> come on. I never, I feel like it's so weird to stand back there. Like we should like, we should see each other, right? You can say hi to me too. Okay. Right. So I'm going to repeat some of what you said so that class can hear. So making everyone one instead of individuals through processes of uh, the material, taking away one's material, goods, clothing, jewelry, individuality, names, the tattooing, hair, right? So the physical dimension of dehumanization. Hmm? Right, so there's like a social dimension to dehumanization too. So dehumanization on an individual level in terms of one being stripped of those things that make us individuals, but on a social level, um, that you're in a situation where good and bad, morality, kind of everyday how we treat one another, that, that it's almost like a kind of reduced to the most base instincts of survival, where you can take someone else's uh, food and again, you know, the question of assigning blame here, I mean, it's really impossible from our, state of, you know, our standpoint to do so. One can't imagine the kind of the social structures that would, that would turn people against, you know, potentially even sons against fathers or siblings against one another in those most base, elemental, urgent, um, horrific, you know, moments. 
Mm. That, for example, they said that by the time they got to the last camp, the crematorium and the smoke didn't even really affect them as it did when they arrived in Birkenau the, fir the first night. And also with the, the little kid that got hung in front of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, it, at, it was shocking to see the first couple hanging and stuff, and at the end it just mm. became a part of their... Right. right. They were saying mourners, Scottish for themselves. Right, so death became not something that's singular and valued and meaningful, but, but it just became an everyday occurrence. It was everywhere. Renee Firestone talks about this extensively at the end of her testimony, that death was everywhere. And it really, in that regard, it, it lost its significance. It lost its meaning. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so this element of mockery, I mean, this is element of absurdity, that you could have a band playing uh, during like, the ro roll call, that you could even think about, or even in, in, in night, I mean, he actually these moments of great beauty. You have a Juliac playing a Beethoven sonata during a death march, and he's thinking of this radical incongruity that one could have, you know, human culture, beauty, music, side by side, and perhaps even simultaneous with horror or the absurdity of the Nazis playing music uh, during, uh, during a, a roll call. Uh, something that Death Fugue, the Ceylon poem that we'll look at next time, is essentially uh, a meditation on. Yeah, back there. Right. So the processes of, of kind of the dehumanization connected with the sequence of events, you know, from being herded onto a cattle car, not knowing where you're going, being on there for days on end, being herded off, being selected, the whole process. I mean, you said animality or sort of animal-like, but I mean, you know, even animals, you know, may be treated, you know, with more dignity. So it's, a, it's extraordinary to, to think about it. Good. I've, I've never walked this far, so it's nice to see you all. Um, you can, uh, it's sort of odd that you know, I'm always talking at you, but certainly I hope you feel like you can dialogue a little bit. Um, I'm going to summarize. I mean, many of the things I've said already, but I want to kind of put on a, the screen a summary of some of these elements of dehumanization and then talk specifically about um, Ali Wiesel's night. And there's a lot of them, and I'll just kind of go through a few of them right now. And I think this, this is echoed in Renee Firestone. So this process of stripping of individuality, one of the first things we talk about, loss of identity, you know, you become marked. But not only marked in terms of a number, but also the elements of nakedness, something that I think really Renee Firestone comes back to multiple times, that not only are you stripped of your clothes, which is, of course, your, your dignity and your head is shaved, but there's a sense of, nakedness, not just being a physical state, but an existential state. And that has to do with vulnerability, right? If you're naked, you're, 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 you're not shielded from anyone. You're exposed. And you're naked to the gaze of the SS officers. If you remember in her testimony, she talks about, they said, you're going to go take a shower, and all the Nazi officers, the male officers, stood there watching. Right? Nakedness as, yes, you're being looked at, you're being violated, you're vulnerable, but it also became nakedness of your state of being, that you were permanently violated, you were permanently vulnerable. So nakedness becomes a huge element. Um, things, done not, things done to individuals in mass, meaning you're no longer as an individual, you're no longer really, you're no longer... It's no longer about what you yourself do, but you're treated as a mass, as a collective. Again, I go back to Renee Firestone's testimony, and one of her messages to the future is precisely never to treat people as a collective. A really, I think, very prescient and, and relevant and very timely reminder. The absurdity. 
that this is a world that doesn't make any sense in terms of its rational social structures. It's absurd. I mean, it's absurd in the sense that it takes all of those things that we consider to be meaningful and valuable, right? The things that are meant to preserve life, like schools or, you know, religious institutions or hospitals, all the things that, you know, are part of the social fabric of our society. It strips those things away and turns them upside down. This is a place only meant to have people function as slave laborers, and where they're no longer able to labor, they're extinguished because they're not worth anything. They're not, uh, they're not useful anymore. Their use value is only insofar as they can slave away at something, and when they can't, they're extinguished. Elie Wiesel talks about the world, and this is a really interesting quote. I'm going to just sometimes read you things from, from the memoir. But he remarks at one point um, when, uh, when they're on day two of travel. So when this is after they've been rounded up, they've been shoved onto a cattle car. He said the doors were nailed, the way back irrevoc irrevocably cut off. The world had become a hermetically sealed cattle car. And it's an extraordinary kind of meditation. It's like suddenly all the possibilities. When you think of like the world you're in, of course, we're not only in our own world, like, you know, our home, our school, wherever we kind of, our car, wherever we want to go, but the world for us is an, a space of possibility, right? I mean, all of us have aspirations. But as soon as your world becomes a cattle car, it's not only spatially enclosed, it's also temporally enclosed. So it's like you no longer have a future. Or if you do have a future, you have no idea what it is because you're not in control. Someone else's. So this issue of, kind of goes on down to the next one, this hermetically sealed cattle car as the world is also, a, I think, a very strong meditation of one of the things that you're stripped of, or one of the things that survivors are stripped of, is their agency, their ability to act as they want. You know, we all have, you know, we prize our freedom, our agency. You know, if you want to get up and go, you go. If you have to do, do something, you do it. Um, of course, there's rules. We know that. Of course, within the, you know, we, we, we operate in a society. But for the most part, we decide, you know, what we make choices. And part of our humanity is our agency. That we can make our choices. And that these choices also have to do with how we fashion ourselves in the future. Right? Our professional aspirations, our hopes. You want to have family, you want to become a doctor, a lawyer, whatever. But if you no longer have agency, you're in a world of a hermetically sealed cattle car. You have this issue of a loss of time, right? That time has no more significance. And if anything, you're at the mercy of what he says, the bell. The bell, which is just the call, the roll call. A couple other things I just want to go through. When he talks about the hermetically sealed boxcar, I mean, in the, in, the, in the testimony, it's very interesting to kind of think of how he puts the pieces together. That's exactly the moment that he tells the story of a so-called, a woman named Miss Schechter. And you remember the story is, this is a story of a woman on the, in, the, in the cattle car who's screaming out. You know, she's screaming out these like visions of seeing, she's like, I see fire, I see flames, huge flames. And she's you know, she's screaming out in a kind of way that people in the cattle car think she's crazy. And what they do is they essentially beat her down. I mean, they essentially, he talks about that they need to silence her because what she's saying is so not only outrageous, but so loud and so, so mad. They say, keep her quiet, make that mad woman shut up. She's not the only one here. She received blows to her head, blows that would have been lethal. That could have been lethal. Her son was clinging desperately to her, not uttering a word. He was no longer crying. A couple sentences later, when they get there, you know, what do they see? You know, in Auschwitz, exactly what Ms. Schechter said, you know, fire, flames. So this issue of, you know, what's, what's sane, what's insane, what's, what's, what's possible, what's believable, you know, what's rational, all these things become blurred. Not only that, I mean, how do you treat people, right? I mean, that you could, that someone could be screaming and you could beat her down, you know, in a cattle car. 
um, you know, a, a remarkable kind of, you know, example of here you have, if the world is truly a hermetically sealed boxcar, and it was for him at this moment, that actions like that would also be utterly permissible. What does Elie Wiesel, and I'd say Ruth Firestone, largely talk about in their testimonies is the destruction of family. I mean, this is such an important part of both of their testimonies, is the separation from their parents, separation from their siblings, the loss of capacity to not only love, but also express empathy with suffering. To me, you know, a large part of so much of the testimony is also this question of, of where, you know, where one thinks about what had happened to get to that point when you can no longer empathize with suffering. And that in, again, the world as a hermetically sealed cattle car, this is, this is a possibility. It's a lot of our humanity also has to do with our ability to be humane to one another. I'll come back to the story of Rabbi Eliyahu in a minute. But other things, I mean, many people have remarked, and I think you'll probably have seen, you know, the loss of faith, uh, is faith in God, obviously is a key part of, of Elie Wiesel's testimony. But I would also say something you know, remarkable that, that perhaps is maybe a little less remarked is this question around, you know, the future. And when he remarks um, about that moment where he thought his father was going to be selected, this is uh, on page 75 here I mentioned, he talks about um, the two things his father gives him at that moment where he's afraid he's going to be selected and, and killed, and it's a knife and a spoon, right? The two most almost banal everyday objects of life. You know, how many knives and spoons do we have in our kitchen? Do we, you know, we just have them. They're just things we have around the house. And he remarks um, in, in, a, in a way that I think, again, is very typical for the testimonial genre. He says, here, take this knife, as his father. I won't need it anymore. You may find it useful. Also, take the spoon. Don't sell it. Quickly, go ahead, take what I'm giving you. And then Elie Wiesel writes, my inheritance, dot, dot, dot. You know, this amazing kind of reflection. It's like, did that happen? Did he think that at that moment? Did he think that after the fact? Did he think it, you know, could he have said more about it? The, this moment of language that can no longer describe, and yet it says so much by just ending there. Right? This is an example, I mean, a tremendous example of loss that almost everything that his father, in a moment of great generosity, could think that the only thing he could give his son at this point is just the very tools to sustain his existence, his material, physical existence. And it's not the inheritance, I don't think it means just like, oh my gosh, this is the inheritance, but an act of love. His father was giving him the tools for him to survive. So really, you know, I think a kind of profound interruption in this testimony. Last thing, or actually last two things I want to say about dehumanization here, these last two issues around loss of one's own death. And this is something that I think is really borne out um, in both um, Elie Wiesel and Renee Firestone, the, that, that dying and death has no sanctity. Um, no respect for the deceased. <laughs> that is, there's really not even a distinction anymore between living and dying that death was everywhere, um, that you could say the Kaddish, the Jewish prayer for the dead, over oneself, um, so to speak, before you died. But no one was, there was no tombstones, there's no burial ceremony, there's no kind of consecration of the dead, all those things that are such an important part of our humanity, and death is, is an important part of it, because it's a moment of ritualizing and, and remembering and respecting the dead, all those things have been stripped away. And then on top of it, for him to talk about the shame. That is the shame about his own actions or inactions with regard to uh, the death of his father. So these are, you know, this is, this is heavy. It's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. You know, I, I read this, I don't know how many times, but probably dozens and dozens of times. And in terms of its emotional weight, you know, it, it still, you know, it's, it's very profoundly effective. So maybe to kind of connect that with, you know, humanization, 
I kind of wanted to say something that also helps us appreciate these aspects of dehumanization that have been testified to. Because I mentioned that question of connecting testimony with survival. And survival also has a lot to do with also a return to humanity. Also a return to those things that we value as part of our human, you know, interactions. The most fundamental things that make us human is obviously, you know, our individuality, our identities the ability to empathize and form communities, right? This question around agency, that we make decisions about our, destino, our destiny. The fact that survival and testimony are deeply interlinked here, because to bear witness or survive is not only to know something, but also to compose our lives, um, not only for ourselves, but for others, to give our lives meaning. Right? I mean, maybe you, maybe you keep a diary um, about your experiences. I mean, maybe you, want to, you had an experience in your life that you want to put into narrative. And as you do so, you make selections about how you would organize it and what you want to say. And experiences that happen later, maybe knowledge that you gained or other feelings, they change over time. And as you compose your life, you also are simultaneously reflecting on that process of composition. And that certainly happens uh, in, in Elie Wiesel. There's a number of very interesting moments where things that happened well into the future also impact how he sees the past. And that, to me, I think is a critical part of testimony. It's not just a chronology of what happened. It's also a sense-making process of making sense about what happened. Obviously, you know, we, me, <laughs> you and I, those of us who are not in a world of a cattle car, we're, we're temporal beings, meaning we have our past, our present, our futures. We're all three of these things simultaneously. You know, we're where we came from, our families, our memories, our experiences, our childhood, that time that you were fighting with your sibling you know, when you were eight. You know, all those things that make up your past, that moment that you're in right now, here in this class at UCLA, but also your hopes you know, your desires, like who you want to be, your aspirations. You know, we're always living in three time dimensions. So we have all three. You can't strip away, you know, where you came from. You're in the present, and you're also kind of going forward somewhere. But to be stripped of that, to have the past and the future cut off, and just be in the present, Primo Levi calls it the animality of being only in the present. Obviously, things like language, culture, history, past, our imagination, these are all parts of our humanity. Our physical bodies, the fact that we can go exercise, you know, we can be healthy, we can take vitamins, all these things that are about, you know, that, that nourish us, right? These are all aspects of our, our humanity. And finally, you know, we talked about death already, but it's something that in our humanity is sanctified. In our society, I think in any society, not only does it come at the end of life, but there's an honor and respect uh, for the dead. Found out shortly after the war, I don't know exactly when, but um, there are moments in the testimony, I think, where he says that, you know, that was the last time I saw them, which is the experience, but he knew after he had survived what the fate of his family was. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit more about some of the, the, genre, the genre of testimony, and then I'm going to go to like two slides on Wiesel, then I'm going to go to Firestone. But it's easy enough to say that a testimony is, is a story about what happened. And I think on some level, yes, it is that. It's a story of what an individual went through, and it's their putting it into narrative to make sense of it. And so you could say it tells a more or less, and I think the more or less is important, because it's not always chronological, chronological story of survival. It testifies to facts in a sense of, facts that were experienced. There's an inexplicable experiential dimension to testimony. Like, this happened. I offer you proof through my account, through my, the tattoo on my body, through the, 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 you know, the horror that I witnessed before you. I can tell you what I saw, right? So in this regard, testimony is also connected with offering an element of proof, 
But it's always, and this is what's so interesting, it's not just chronological. It's often interrupted by what you might call the traumatic past. Like it's the, the resurfacing of these painful memories. So you're composing it after the fact, but these memories are resurfacing sometimes as, as you know, demons, right? Things that, that, that are so painful. In this moment of reflection, like you're reflecting on the present, like this moment of telling, and there's elements of kind of, I think, future hope or learning, especially the case with Renee Firestone, where you have these elements uh, that enter into her testimony of what do you take from this? So what do we do now that we know this? Um, what, is, what is her hope? So where does this happen in, in Elie Wiesel? I mean, a couple of places where you have the, the story that's chronological, interrupted. I think, personally, one of the most powerful are these side comments he sometimes makes. So this is page 11. He says, three days later, a new decree. Every Jew had to wear the yellow star. You know, da da da. Some prominent members of the community came to consult with my father, who had connections with the upper levels of the Hungarian police. My father's view was that this was not all bleak. Or perhaps he just did not want to discourage others to throw salt on their wounds. His father is quoted here as saying, quote, the yellow star, so what? It's not lethal, dot, dot, dot. And then in parentheses, Ali Wiesel remarks, poor father, of what then did you die? A really interesting moment in his testimony, right? This is before he's even told the story of his father dying on page 11. At the very beginning, he's already fast forwarding, telling us that he died and reflecting on the importance that the dehumanization started with the yellow star. It didn't start with the deportation, it didn't start in Auschwitz, it didn't start in Buchenwald, it didn't happen on the death march. It happened at that mar moment that he was targeted as different and forced to wear a yellow star. Poor father, of what then did you die? Remarkable element. Again, this chronology interrupted by something that happened later, reflecting on the significance of something that may have gone unremarked otherwise. He does this many times. There's another time, this is on page 32, just to give you another example, because I think it's so powerful to understand this genre. He talks about um, horrific scenes. Uh, he talks about you know, what, what, he had, what he had witnessed. Um, and this is um, now with regard to the crematoria. He says, you know, a, a truck drew close and unloaded its hold. Small children, babies... Yes, I did see this with my own eyes. Children thrown into the flames. And as it, in parentheses, he, he remarks, is it any wonder that ever since then sleep tends to elude me? So these, these moments of interruption, right? These moments of testifying and then interrupting because you're, you're displaced in some ways from the experience, right? You're, you're testifying in some other period in time about something that happened prior and trying to make sense of it. It happens all the time in testimony. And that's, again, what makes the genre so, so rich. So you have this kind of objective history of exactly you know, what an individual went through linked with these subjective reflections that form a kind of emotional reality. So it bears witness to an emotional reality. And he'll say things. You know, he'll tell you, you know, what he thought of the bystanders and the Hungarian police. You know, again, can I extrapolate this you know, more broadly? Maybe. He says, you know, he'll remark, the Hungarian police were screaming at us. They ordered us to run. We began to run. Who would have thought that we were so strong? From behind their windows, from behind their shutters, our fellow citizens watched as we passed. This sense of, you know, we're, as people bearing witness testimony, that we're also brought in at this moment, in a kind of a moment of judgment. What does it mean that the fellow citizens watched as we passed? What does it mean, you know, he basically says there were people who had this knowledge, who were behaved as bystanders, and I think the element of testimony also raises this question of, of judgment, of passing judgment of people's actions or inactions. But on a more positive note, this is an interesting example. I don't know if you remember that years later, in the, he meets this uh, French woman in a, in a metro. He remarks on page 53. And it turns out she was in the work camp with him. She had false papers. She was a Jew who was uh, pretending that she was French, but she actually spoke German. And they reunite. There's this kind of moment of recognition many years later. 
And it turns out that she was someone that essentially had given him hope and encouragement in the camp. So someone who had, he had been beaten and she whispered something to him in German, basically saying that, um, you know, asking him to basically, you know, keep quiet, carry on. And those words of encouragement, he found out later, were uttered by this woman, and then that becomes part of his testimony. So again, knowledge gained after the fact about something that then gains great significance because of later knowledge. The temporality is always kind of, it's moving, it's shifting. So I want to get to these last questions and then look at a little bit of Renee Firestone's testimony. Um, we'll, we'll just go to 12.15 today, so you have to... Yeah, that's how long class is, after all. So, I think in another critical part of the testimony genre is these questions, questions around ethics. And ethical questions are, by definition, questions about how you should behave. What should you do? I mean, or what would you do in such a situation? If you could possibly imagine, you know, the chance to be, well, the chance, you know, if you were in such a situation, how would you, how would you behave? These are questions of ethics. I mean, most of the time, and I would argue that these questions are impossible to answer. I <laughs> what I wrote here is impossible to answer because we can't put ourselves in this situation. I'm, you know, I, you can read all you want, and I'd say, you know, I've been reading this stuff for, for decades. I can't possibly figure out what I would have done in such a situation. I'm not there. I'm here. I'm here reading about there. So I don't think we can answer such questions until we're confronted with the urgency of making a choice in our present. So there's moments in your life, and I think like all of us will have to deal with these moments, is like at what moment do we do something, whatever that is. You know, if you're, what decision, you know, you make a decision to be a bystander, you make a decision to look away. Plenty of people did. You're safe. You preserve your life. You go on. You're privileged because you can. The bystander is always a position of privilege. To be a bystander is always a position of privilege. You're not targeted. So until you're confronted with the urgency of choice or the urgency of acting, we really can't know how we would behave or what we do. So ethical questions I don't think can be ascribed to the past. I don't think we can say, oh gosh, if I was in that situation there with my father and you know, I had to run away on a death march, I'd stay with him for sure the whole time. I would never do what Rabbi Eliyahu's son did, which was desert his father. I would never do that. We can't answer that. It's impossible. We can't answer that. But we can answer what we would do at this moment, at this moment in time, if confronted with some other ethical question. And I think to me, if I was to over-extrapolate lessons from testimony, they have a lot to do with how we would behave in our present not how we would behave as if we were in the past. So when he recounts this question around Rabbi Eliyahu and even his own sense of failing the test, he says, you know, he confronted something similar, almost a sense when his father passed away and that moment of shame overcame him, he says there was a certain amount of relief that he would actually have, you know, essentially more food, that he would be free of the burden of his father that he couldn't take care of and he says, just like Rabbi Eliyahu's son, I had not passed the test. What's the test? I mean, the test is that you're supposed to be there for your father. You know, remarkable, remarkable part of his testimony. But this is his testimony. He's in that experience. The ethical question for him is one of being in the moment. It's not the ethical question for us. The ethical question for us is we have our own moments and we'll be tested in our own ways, and then we can be ashamed or not ashamed or proud or not proud of what we do. Was there a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Well, I mean, Elie Wiesel had a strong faith in God, and he talks about that process of losing that faith. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it would be very hard to generalize I mean, this question. I've seen testimonies where people have maintained their faith throughout, other examples where people had had their faith questioned, people who came not religious, who became more religious, and the opposite, people who were religious and became more secular or agnostic. You know, it varies tremendously, and I think it would be an interesting study but, you know, of the maybe, I don't know, dozens of testimonies that I've heard, um, many people had their faith, I would say, stretched. And certainly, this testimony is an example of exactly that, of, how, of losing one's faith in, in a benign and um, in a God who would, yeah, who, who would, I guess, look out for or shepherd, you know, his people. Um, so, so, yeah, I'm not going to actually talk about that more because I don't actually, I don't think it's possible to generalize, you know, further. Um, but I do want to go to these last two things, and I want to make sure we have a chance to look at Renee Firestone's testimony a little bit. And that is, and, and if I have to, I'll just go over, um, the element of disbelief. And this is an element that's in so much of the testimony genre that you struggle to find the language to, to approximate the magnitude of the events. Right? I mean, even at the very beginning of Ali Wiesel's testimony, you know, there's a kind of disbelief. It's like, this could be happening, like, like right now? Like, and he says on page 8, you know, we doubted his resolve, meaning Hitler's resolve to exterminate us, annihilate an entire people, wipe out a population dispersed throughout so many nations, so many millions of people. By what means? In the middle of the 20th century? Right? This element of, at the very beginning, this element of disbelief. So let me I'm going to bring up um, her testimony. And there's this, a number of things that are very interesting about it. I mean, there's, I hope that you, if you had to, you know, if they found that two and a half hours was too long, what you could do, I'd recommend watch the first maybe 40 or so minutes, 45 minutes, where she talks about up to the death of her sister. And then starting around hour 149, 150, she goes to Auschwitz. And this is um, 50 years later. Auschwitz was liberated on January 28th, uh, 1945, by the Soviet army. And she's there 50 years later, and she's walking around in the winter. It's very cold, and she's talking about um, essentially testifying in Auschwitz. And a number of things that are remarkable, I mean, as you just even look at this picture, I showed you maps of Auschwitz. It's very hard to understand how big it is. And uh, I've been to Auschwitz, I've walked around it, and maybe some of you have as well. It's miles long. Um, you can get a sense of the sheer scope of this place, enclosed in barbed wire, um, fences, barracks, train, uh, railway lines, most of which uh, is fallen into um, kind of ruin, but all of which is still, the land is still there, the place is still there. And so the sheer size is one of the things that she remarks on. Let's listen to her talk a little bit as she walks. I'm going to, sorry. Oops. It gets better in a second, don't worry. <laughs> 
So I'm going to stop right there so we can have a little reflection. So a couple of things about the Shoah Foundation. Um, the video that you saw, the first part of the video was taken in her house. Uh, she actually lives here in Beverly Hills. Um, it was filmed as one of the first survival, uh, survivor testimonies by the Shoah Foundation. This was established shortly after Steven Spielberg's film Schindler's List came out in 1993. Her testimony was taken in 1994. And then the following year, she went uh, for the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz to Auschwitz, and they continued her testimony in Auschwitz. And so you're seeing basically two testimonies. The first part is her talking you know, with an interviewer in her house, and the second part is her really just as a kind of reflective monologue that's been put together, many different parts of it, uh, where she's sort of reflecting on both the being in the camp again, you know, being back in Auschwitz 50 years later, but also what its meaning is uh, in, the, in the present. And so that's, that's what, you're, what you're seeing here. Um, responses or thoughts um, as, you, as you watch this? Or as you watched any part of her testimony? I'm just curious, um, how do we, yeah, what do we, what do you, I mean, what do we do with it? I mean, essentially, what do we make of her testimony? How does it, yeah, what does it add, maybe, that Elie Wiesel's testimony also, you know, what similar, different, what do you think? Mm -hmm. It's obviously puts this personal side to the story in terms of instead of thinking like mm -hmm. you know, all we think about is in the middle the middle of the hundreds of thousands of Jews that went to these camps and the thousands that were sent to be exterminated, we think what were what were they physically thinking mm -hmm. each one of them personally mm -hmm. as this was all happening as mm -hmm. opposed to just putting them all together as their right. collective fate. Mm -hmm. What were they all thinking as mm -hmm. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm going to extrapolate from what you're saying because I think it's, it's a really profound observation, which is testimony is profoundly individualizing and deporting people is profoundly collectivizing, right? So basically, all as victims being treated by the Nazis in mass, they're all the same. And in testimony, every single story is different. And so you have Elie Wiesel's story and you have Renee Firestone. It's just two out of obviously millions of stories that one could have. But insofar as it exists as an individual, it's defiant of that Nazi way of seeing individuals as not individuals but as collectives. And so in that regard, testimony is profoundly humanizing because it's individualizing. And so I think that's a really remarkable point. And even, you know, the solitariness of her in this camp at this moment, I mean, it's really remarkable. The camp is not only is it empty, I mean, occasionally you'll see people actually walking around there. I mean, the camp is preserved today. It's, um, it's partly a museum. It's partly, um, you know, you can walk around. But, I mean, to see an individual going back, you know, 50 years later, testifying not only to what she went through, but also its meaning, right? Because so much of what she's doing is she's reflecting on what does it mean that I survived? What does it mean that I had these experiences? And the profound struggle, right? The profound struggle to find a language to talk about it. And so much of what she talks about is this sense of, I can't put it into words. And it really is connected. That, that sense of not being able to put it to words is also connected with the physicality of being there. Because the structures, like the architecture, the empty spaces, those, those spaces of death, right? The crematoria, the, the electric wire, all these, this, this kind of these spaces that are so connected to horrific things, they speak in some ways for themselves. And putting into language almost can't approximate that horror, this, this horror of the architecture of death. So I'll play another little part for you. So I think it's around minute 204. So this is, I think, a really interesting moment in her testimony where she's up against, she goes up to the barbed wire and, and she touches it. And, uh, and it's extraordinary, I mean, I found this is actually extremely touching in some ways, but also an interesting moment of almost like a slight defiance in the sense of not only did I survive, 
but I can testify, and here I am today, and I can touch this barbed wire, something that I could not have done the last time I was in Auschwitz. And in fact, people who would have touched that barbed wire did so either because they were thrown against it or they committed suicide. And she recounts the fact that these electrical wires, many people who couldn't continue, threw themselves against the barbed wire and committed suicide. And there, there she touches it today as a moment of being out of time, of having survived, and then being back to testify. And I think this is such a remarkable and, and really almost like very beautiful portrait. I'm going to let it play. I just, I don't want to overinterpret the significance of this, but I do think it's so telling that she connects herself to the past by holding on to the barbed wire. And she's there at that moment of exactly the limit, right? That moment of death, of destruction, of, of being out of time and yet being connected to time, of holding on to that wire, and then wondering, what is all the meaning of this? Like, what do, I, what do we learn from this? Like, what do we take of this? And for her, it's also, it's about what that memory means to others. Why don't people like to live our hands. in peace with each other? Why do they live to respect one another? It's unbelievable. Unbelievable that we still can't get along. We still can't live with each other. Look at this place. Look, look at the size of it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the millions that perished here? It's hard for them to remember. It's hard for them to comprehend what I experienced here. I only hope that we never happen to any people anywhere in the world. That's all I hope for, and that's all I pray for. Before we... Okay. Comments or thoughts before we wrap up? So perhaps that's uh, a good enough place to, to end for today. As I said, if you didn't watch uh, the testimony, definitely watch the last 20 or 30 minutes. Um, we're going to take up poetry next time, and we'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>